Oliver, Pete, and Michaela are currently surrounded from two sides by Ophelia and Cyrus. The most panic among the three is Pete, he even wants to draw his sword. However, Oliver immediately prevents him from doing so. If he were to draw his sword, Ophelia and Cyrus would have a reason to attack. Fortunately, Ophelia and Cyrus are provoking each other, so the three of them are not involved. According to Ophelia, it seems Cyrus enjoys collecting corpses for his bone magic. As for Ophelia, she likes to collect men to sow seeds in her. In fact, Cyrus goes as far as to refer to Ophelia as Succubus Salvadori. Ophelia feels deeply offended when that term is used. Cyrus initiates the attack by reciting Tsong Regina. His bone magic forms into a four-legged creature. Then, Ophelia recites Balthus. From her abdomen, a creature of equal size to Cyrus' bone creature emerges. Pete is unfamiliar with summoning magic like that. However, according to Oliver, it's not summoning magic, but Ophelia is indeed giving birth to that creature. While the two creatures are fighting, Oliver, Pete, and Michaela use the opportunity to escape. Unfortunately, Cyrus still has bones to hinder the three of them. However, unexpectedly, none out comes from behind them. None out senses nostalgia upon seeing this place filled with death. None out is able to easily destroy the bones blocking the three of them. She says she'll handle Ophelia and Cyrus, urging the three of them to just escape. None out reveals that her body only seeks a place to die. Oliver doesn't quite understand why none out says that, but he certainly disagrees. Oliver also draws his sword to chase after none out. Suddenly, nearby, someone recites Ignis. The incantation releases fire that incinerates Ophelia and Cyrus creatures in an instant. The man who casts the spell reminds them not to disturb the new students. He promises that no seniors will bother them again. He swears in the name of Osa's chairman Kimberly, Alvin Godfrey. People commonly call him the Holy Flame. Not alone, Alvin is accompanied by a girl, Carlos Vitro, a fifth-year student who serves as a prefect. With that, Ophelia and Cyrus are forced to retreat willingly or not. Carlos states that they can now rest assured. There's no safer place in Kimberly than being near Alvin. Luckily, the three of them didn't become victims of Ophelia and Cyrus' magic. After being escorted outside by Alvin and Carlos, the three of them had now reunited with their other friends. Oliver could no longer contain his anger towards none out. He daringly risked his life by pursuing the three of them alone. Not only that, None Out even mentioned that she was searching for a place to die. Michaela tried to calm Oliver down. She understood Oliver's feelings, but she suggested that they listen to Non El's explanation first. Non El then began to recount her life. She didn't deny that Oliver's words were true. Non El had lost her will to live since a long time ago. She wasn't even sure if she was truly alive at the moment. In the past, during the fierce battle with Soma Yoshihisa's forces, Nan Al had also participated in the war. The enemy forces numbered 50,000, while Nan Al's forces only consisted of 200 people. Most of the time, Nan Al only remembered killing the enemies one by one. Unbeknownst to her, she had become trapped in the midst of the enemy siege. Nan Al immediately leapt behind the enemy lines on her horse. She intended to decapitate General Soma Yoshihisa. A soldier tried to stop her. The soldier seemed to struggle to withstand the power of Nan El's sword, and eventually, Nan El managed to strike him down. General Soma ordered his guards to surround Nan El with her spears. When General Soma approached her to negotiate, Nan El requested a duel with his son, known as the strongest fighter in their family. However, Nan El's words only further enraged General Soma. Understandably so, the soldier Nan El had just struck down turned out to be his son. Nan El had cut down someone without knowing their identity. General Soma threatened to end Nan El's life without bothering to ask her name. It was his form of revenge. Just as the spears of the soldiers were about to reach her, a magical barrier appeared to halt the spears. From above the sky, a witch was seen flying on a broomstick. The witch was baffled by the customs of this land. She couldn't grasp why not asking for a name was considered a form of revenge. Nonetheless, she had come here because she was intrigued by the talented child. 
As a teacher, she couldn't allow the child to die just like that. The witch offered Nan'el to come to her land and become a witch. As Nan'el had once recounted, the witch was a McFarlane, who turned out to be Michaela's father. Since that incident, Nan'el felt like she was living in an incredibly long dream. Nan'el feared that she might not realize her desires before awakening from that dream. In her swordsmanship academy, she was taught to kill those she respected. Nan'el herself understood that this sounded absurd. Nonetheless, she felt it when clashing swords with Oliver. Nan'el knew that Oliver would likely reject her. After all, Oliver wasn't obligated to engage in mutual combat with her. However, Oliver's outright rejection still left her feeling sad and tormented. Gradually, this sadness led her to yearn for a place to die. Katie concluded that Nan'el was heartbroken due to Oliver's rejection. Oliver asked Katie not to joke, but Nan'el regarded the statement as accurate. Whether it was falling in love with him or his swordsmanship prowess, it all felt the same. Oliver was puzzled about how to respond. Michaela inquired whether a normal duel wouldn't suffice. Nan'el explained that the sword techniques she learned were techniques for killing. Therefore, if they weren't intending to kill each other, she couldn't fight seriously. As a friend, Michaela wanted to say something. She reassured Nan'el that it was time to change her way of life. She convinced Nan'el that she was indeed alive, not in a dream or illusion. If there was no distinction between falling in love with him or his swordsmanship, then what Nan'el should focus on was him. Furthermore, all their friends here still wanted to spend time with her. Afterward, Oliver asked Nan'el to make a promise to him. From now on, no matter what happened, Nan'el mustn't rush to die. Regardless of the circumstances, she should use the sword for self-preservation. Following all this, Nan'el finally apologized for being cowardly and foolish. She pledged not to squander her life anymore. Additionally, she asked to be taught how to live in this place. Honestly, Nan'el felt she couldn't keep up with the lessons at this academy. However, that was only natural. Even Pete was just learning to use magic. The next day, as they headed to school together, Nan'el seemed to be sticking closer to Oliver. She walked alongside Oliver closely, trying to observe him. Oliver was clearly embarrassed being scrutinized by a girl up close. Nevertheless, he seemed to prefer the current situation. Nan'el needed to realize that his life wasn't solely about swords. During the magic sword class, Master Garland provided an opportunity for the students to ask questions. One student was curious if Master Garland could use the spellblade technique. Beforehand, Master Garland wanted to explain its concept. In the realm of magical swordsmanship, there existed a technique known as spellblade. This definition was quite simple. This technique was executed with a single step, a single incantation. It was an unstoppable move that would inevitably defeat its opponent. There were known to be a total of six spellblade techniques. Although there were individuals who attempted to create new spellblades or destroy existing ones, these six spellblades had remained unchanged since ancient times. This technique was highly secretive. The user and the type of spellblade were never disclosed to the public. Some even doubted the existence of spellblade. Hence, Master Garland couldn't reveal whether he could wield the spellblade or not. Nanel was truly intrigued by the existence of such a technique. As usual, Andrews approached Oliver and Nanel to provoke them. Oliver had no intention of fighting, but for some reason, his words always managed to anger Andrews. He wanted to spar with Oliver. Oliver reluctantly agreed. Before their bout, Nanel realized that Oliver appeared disheartened. She suggested that he might be deliberately intending to lose. Nanel didn't want to see him lose, even if it was just an act. She asked Oliver to do it seriously. Andrews, of course, couldn't accept if Oliver practiced without seriousness. He felt greatly underestimated. Unfortunately, their feud was interrupted by Master Garland. After the lesson, Michaela recounted that Andrews was her childhood friend. During their childhood, Andrews and Michaela were often compared to each other by their families. Perhaps Andrews always felt that his current position could easily be taken by someone else. Michaela felt responsible for her attitude of always wanting to prove her strength. Suddenly, 
Peter arrived to inform them that Katie had rushed out upon hearing about a rampaging troll just before the execution parade. Currently, Katie was in front of the troll's cage, trying to prevent a teacher from executing it. The teacher recognized her as part of the Alto family upon hearing her name. According to the teacher, Katie's parents were among the most foolish within the human rights faction. The teacher inquired if Katie would take responsibility if the troll ended up killing someone. Katie stated that she would try to persuade the troll not to attack humans. The teacher found it absurd to think of reasoning with a troll. Katie was clearly upset and snapped back at the teacher. The teacher then used the dollar incantation, shocking Katie's body. At that moment, Oliver and the others finally arrived. Oliver recognized the teacher in front of them as Darius Grenville. As Darius tried to punish the others as well, Vera Milligan, a fourth-year student, intervened to stop him. She informed them that there had indeed been a lot of resistance against the troll's execution. Master Garland also arrived and reminded Darius that the use of torture incantations as punishment had been banned for five years. Master Garland then explained in more detail that the investigation into the troll's potential reasons for its anger was still insufficient. The troll needed to be kept alive as both evidence and a witness. The Academy had also approved this decision. Vera informed Katie that she too was worried about the execution. She revealed that she was a half-human enthusiast as well. During the journey back to the dormitory, Katie appeared to be continuously smiling. She expressed her happiness at meeting Vera. Suddenly, a spirit servant dropped a letter before them. The letter was from Andrews. He stated that he wanted to duel against Oliver and Nano.